So our comment will be provided by Katherine Norris, who received her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and taught at Caltech and American before becoming a visiting scholar in the Johns Hopkins University History Department in 2009. She currently teaches part-time at the National Cathedral School in Washington, D.C., and at the Maryland Institute College of Art. And just, again, late last week, uh, published an article in a special issue of Société en Représentation. It's Mentir à l'âge de l'innocence, enfance, science, et anxiété culturelle dans la France fin de siècle. I should have read that before, sorry. Um, and she's in the process yeah. She's in the process of completing a book manuscript, Reinventing Childhood, Politics, Culture, and the Sciences of the Child in Modern France, 1870 to 1940. I look forward to hearing what she has to say. Is my microphone set? Do I need to do anything? Okay, hello everybody. I am very tempted. I love these papers. This is a really wonderful panel that has all kinds of unexpected as well as more straightforward connections among the papers. And I think what I would really like to do, I have a bunch of questions for the panelists, but I would love to hear from the audience. And I, what I may do is we'll see how many questions there are. I want to say a few brief words and then open things up to the audience a little bit sooner maybe than I had intended to. And then we can come back and I can, you know, ask some of the, I can go on at some length, but I think what really struck me so much about this and what strikes me very much about any efforts to understand the history of childhood is, of course, the tension between our access to the prescriptive literature, the stuff that is being produced by adults for children based on certain assumptions about what childhood is or should be, and that is or should be is always a tremendous tension, and in fact, or has at least been a tremendous tension since as far back as Fenelon and, and certainly coming to the fore in the 19th century with the romantic visions of childhood and then up forward through certainly today. Um, and as I've discovered in my own work on the history of child psychology, what always fascinates me much more, and this may say something about my character as well as about the literature, the naughty ones are always more fun. Um, no matter how many times you read prescriptive literature, it's much more fun to find out where people do things that they weren't supposed to do with their uh, products presented to them by adults. Um, and so what I found myself wondering about in many of the papers, and you, you've brought this out in different ways, um, is on the one hand, the way in which what we see here is the creation of an extra-scholastic, edifying and educational experience, whether through the theater, through dolls, through literature that's supposed to break down sexism that finds itself outside of the mainstream mode, but that in many ways reinforces, is the usual types of questions that one always asks about children's history, which is, well, what did the kids really think? You know, who really went to the theater? Who was, do you have evidence of people playing with that stuff? And what is the readership of these books that you, and you, you talk in the paper about, Julie, about it being lower than they had expected. And, but, so I could ask you the easy questions, which is, well, tell me what kids were really doing. But I actually don't want to do that. What I want to do, you know, insofar as you may be able to get access to this, uh, the subscription figures of the Théâtre Comte or experiences about the circulation and the packaging of those, uh, the, the doll literature, or, you know, you may actually be able to ask these kinds of questions, although I have, I don't know how open they are. What I'd really like to talk about is the ways in which adults are constructing the tools and venues within which children can construct or imagine or understand their own childhoods and what we can do to try to understand how the adults are providing a particular framework that says an awful lot about adults being parents whether it's parents being told that they should want or that kids will demand that they go to theaters or that they buy these things. The, ad the adults are certainly constructing an image of children, a, a particular moral education, a particular access to consumer culture, 
they're raising little consumers or little moralizing them through a set of binaries that we see operative in many of these works that I could go on about. But what does this tell us about the worlds that children have constructed for them that they then can inhabit. In other words, what are we do what are we finding out about the construction of this fascinating framework that has, as Julie so beautifully put it, these these limits around what is the ways in which the preservation of the existing framework actually may con be constructing a message that is not quite what they had hoped, but that may provide a space within which the children themselves can do things that we may or may not be able to get access to. In any case, what I'd like to do, this is a little bit rambling, but um, to me some of the most fascinating stuff is about the kind of imaginative spaces that exist underlying many of these things. The kids in the image of the Théâtre Comte who I'd love to know much more about what the illustrator was trying to convey with that portrayal because it looks like the characters in there are really standing in for adults in the mind of the illustrator. Um, and what I'm wondering is if he's saying that the director of the theater had in fact not given up so much on his profession of you know, uh, magician and phantasmagorist as he would have liked to present. Um, and that the people in the audience that Marcelin was showing may not have been quite as engaged with the central purpose, supposed, of that theater as uh, the, the advertiser, the director, or the audience might have thought. Um, I would love to know much more about some of the funny tensions in, sa in Sarah's uh, doll literature and some of the more technical history. There's a lot to be done there. It's fascinating. Um, I enjoyed all of the papers enormously. And Julie, I have a lot of questions uh, for you as well. What I'd love to know is, um, and this might be hard to do, is what are the really popular children's books that in France, and I don't even know what the awards are that are given that the equivalent of the Caldecott or the Newberry, what is beyond the books that are just popular, but what are the books in, in French children's literature today that are really hot, that kids really like, no matter how commercialized they've gotten? I know Harry Potter has been tremendously, but are there indigenous French books that are of a more um, both popular but rich quality? And what does that do to the comparisons? In any case, um, I can come back and give some more general comments um, about questions about markets and uh, visions of the imaginative and some of the very French tensions that I see in this. But what I'd like to do is open the questions to the audience who undoubtedly have a lot of things that they can ask. So, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I think I was supposed to pass microphone, sorry. Uh, lovely panel. Um, I really, really enjoyed these papers. Um, I guess I have just uh, a question about uh, um, context uh, for Julie and Sarah. Um, I wondered about sort of larger, the some of the larger discursive frames in which some of these um, uh, things were talked about. So Julie, I, I, I don't know the, um, the specific dates of these texts, but I wonder if in, say, the context of all of the debates around the mariage pour tous, if these uh, books were, were targeted. Uh, I can imagine um, somebody like Marine Le Pen having a field day with, with these. So I wonder just about some the context of the reception sort of broad, more broadly. And then with Sarah, I don't know if I can formulate this very well, but I, I'm always intrigued by the kind of liminal status of dolls, or they're lifelike in, in the imagination, but of course they're not. Um, and it reminds me of autom autom automatons, yeah. or automata, uh, which then sort of, you know, I think we know that in the history of uh, psychology at this time, there's a, 
a big discourse around 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 that. Um, I, I just wonder if there's any anything there. Uh, there may not be, um, but uh, you know, uh, it's a, a question that I had um, sort of as you were talking. Thank you. Um, all of these books were published since 2005. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All of these books were published since 2005, and of course there's always a delay with publishing, right? So nothing can come out perfectly. But what's interesting about this collection is there's nothing in the, these collections about homosexuality or homoparentality, as they say in France. However, there are two books that do touch on political themes, two on the wearing of veils. Um, they're both stories of girls who are approaching the moment where they'll have to be veiled and neither of them want it. So it's very interesting. I don't see that. Very strong uh, position on that. And then there's another uh, story that's about uh, domestic abuse, but nothing on what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah no, I, well, I just wondered because the, a lot of the images around Mariage and Portusar, it's about gender difference too, not, not necessarily the sexuality, right? It's, mm. it's, it's a threat. Right. So I wondered. I just wondered if that was in the in the mix here. Right. So all the debate over the ABCD de l'égalité, where they were trying to incorporate gender into school manuals and into teaching, it hasn't yet manifested in Talon O. But it's a good point. Why not? Mm -hmm. um, as for the connection with dolls and uh, automatons, so there is. I mean. At the end of the century, you get increasingly more complicated toys and toys that that do all sorts of things on their own. So there is a kind of shading into that area. That's what reminded me of it. Right, exactly. I have frankly not looked at the literature around it, um, partially because, you know, uh, as one always says, I'm at the beginning of a new project, therefore <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't uh, even gotten to that, although that's an interesting suggestion. Um, I hope to have another chapter just on the proliferation of toys and more complex toys. Uh, because in the same department store catalogs by the end of the century it's just page after page after page of toys you can buy and the minute there's a new invention the automobile is invented there are toy cars and then there's a backlash to that there are certain commentators who believe that toys are too complicated that the simple toys are the best um, as well but that's not a very specific answer to your question I haven't had a chance to talk to Sarah about it yet but Actually, child performers are sort of a nexus of this. Mm -hmm. um, in another chapter, <laughs> not the one I presented here, um, I look at ch child performers that are deemed stars in the 19th century. So uh, these child performers that performed adult roles at the Théâtre Comte, they are perceived more like automatons. They're supposed to replicate adult behavior. Where child star, and none of them are considered child stars. Child stars appear as the only children amongst a cast of otherwise adults. So they're playing children. And when they're good, they're considered to be natural prodigies, natural childish characteristics. If a child performer is considered bad, they are compared to Vaucasson's automaton. Okay. <laughs> um, that they're not lively, they're not realistic. They're just going through the motions. But child performers are also called dolls. They're compared to dolls more often in the first half of the 19th century um, oh. when they're performing adult roles and that's when ad dolls were primarily adult women so that's kind of a point that yeah. joins the, <laughs> the two yeah I actually wanted to add something about that um, if my microphone's on one of the things that this business about the child performers is their performers and their audience there's a lot of the, the children are the creators and there's stuff about the contests that you have uh, where the kids are asked to you know write in with these books and you know one will be selected and I know from my own work in the in the late 19th century material there are a lot of contests not just in women's magazines but also in these children's ones and it ties up with you know then the kid is supposed to be cutting out the paper doll so there's a, a making an artisanal aspect of it and what this got what your question got me thinking about is in many ways what these the, some of these toys look like and the industrial aspect of it is it's very much this chef d'oeuvre um, tradition from from the artisan world where making the little version of something exercises your skills and becomes especially in French um, 
production and French industry, because it's so focused on luxury trades, something that shows off the, the skills of the creator in a different venue, as well as being, um, so it's an educational process in some ways, possibly. I mean, it's a making a bit of a stretch, but I think there's a really interesting dynamic between the creation on the small scale miniature the automata and other kind of efforts to resemble lifelike things and the fact that these kids are playing a dual role as performers and audience, as uh, you know, readers and consumers, but also as participants and um, a bunch of other, and then it, there's writers. So there's a whole nexus of something in there that I think is really interesting. There's the kinesthetic automatism that you would develop by and then the psychic ones that you're talking as an educator. Yeah. So there's something in Yeah. And French. And I guess I'm, I'm going to interject and then I totally will take a question. Um, I also think that there, there might be a site for thinking about class and expense and produ production in looking at the Ape and All prints because they have whole broadsides and gender um, that are this kind of thing where you cut out dolls. Sometimes they're military figures, sometimes they're paper dolls like with fashion, but sometimes they're things like um, a nativity scene or the castle of, of, of you know some person and it involves all of these little pieces that they're supposed to fabricate themselves and they're so inexpensive that they're, they're designed for a really broad swath of people and because of the way they're designed it also means that I think both boys and girls have access uh, which gets back to I think Catherine's question like obviously the paper dolls are intended for girls and the, mil and the, uh, and the little military figures are intended for boys but it's a, they're, they're so much more common and so much more mass produced that you can easily imagine kids mixing them um, much more than you can imagine you know, some of the more expensive things where you, where you set it up in a different way. So it might be something useful to look at. Um, Ellen, and then. So I, I would say um, this panel is the makes the price of the ticket absolutely worth it. I'm so glad I came here. <laughs> and I am I know a bunch of new books I need to buy with all my extra money that I have. So um, I, I, I just wanted to ask you a quick question, which is to reflect a little bit about the functionality or the, and the intention of these various types of children's literature. And I think Catherine has evoked a number of them. Um, and I wonder if you see a kind of shift. I mean, if you're sort of, you're kind of sitting chronologically from Jen, <laughs> right, to the future is the future of, of childhood. Um, but some of the elements that came up in this conversation were uh, moral education, um, situating children in consumer culture, teaching gender roles, um, constructing worlds in which children um, can construct themselves. And then I wonder if you see any kind of evolution of of function and intention towards more um, choice, self-fashioning, and dealing with the society or social issues or social worlds. And that there is also another element, which is interesting. So th then there's two themes that I've noticed also. Um, one is um, um, being naughty. So the <laughs> all the naughty, th and how much children really enjoy, like, programs or books about ex incredibly naughty, bad, you know, um, all the stuff you're not supposed to do and the sort of glee and yet, s you know, censure toward the naughty one. And, um, and the other is the danger that there's kind of the r very real danger of kidnapping, of abuse, of how, d of um, sort of the, the terrors of things that can happen to very vulnerable children. And, and, and so it's interesting that you can talk about things like abduction, rape, through the medium of this doll and do it in the 19th century. And that there are these this, this other issues about how do you deal with the very real world that involves danger and yet do it in a way that is not overwhelming or terrifying. But I, I wondered if you could reflect a little bit on the functionality of, of um, the, the various functions and goals of this type of children's literature, and if you see evolution. Uh, but I, I have to think of, of how to answer. I, I th think there's definitely an evolution 
in the 19th century materials vis-a-vis -vis the consumer culture. Right? Century than earlier in the century, that is probably pretty obvious. Um, in terms of other parts of the narrative, I honestly haven't tracked that, but I, I like the idea. I mean, I need to do some more work. I pulled my examples sort of randomly to show different points rather than presenting them in chronological order. Um, I think the moralizing continues out throughout the century. Um, and I hadn't honestly thought about the vulnerability of children in some of these stories of what happens to the dolls, you know. Um, I mean, I don't think that that girls were in danger of being stolen by, uh, you know, by puppet theaters and turned into marionettes. Um, but, uh, but there is a kind of vicarious uh, fear and therefore the resolution of the fear afterwards. I mean, I think it's working in much more of a psychological um, a fashion. Um, and, and I think the narratives, those narratives are pretty consistent over the century. Um, but again, I'd have to look at it. Um, I'm more interested in something I didn't deal with in the paper and also the class issues that come up. I mean, it's really bourgeois girls. Um, the upper class girls here are always bad caretakers of their dolls. Um, uh, and, uh, and there's, uh, many of the stories have the daughter of the concierge who picks up an abandoned doll and you know, cares for her lovingly as well. Um, so that I think there's also something to track in that um, area as well. And the, the Théâtre Comte was actually put forward as a solution to protect child performers. Um, compared to the 18th century Théâtre d'Enfants, um, where you had children working with adults, the argument was that basically adults corrupted the children. And so if you made an all-child troupe that was isolated from adults, that protected the children. He, that theater ended up falling <laughs> to the same criticisms as the 18th century Théâtre Comte and, uh, of moral corruption of the children. Um, but in the early 19th century when the Théâtre du Petit Monde starts, basically taking a page from Comte, initially, it, it opens in 1919, initially it's, it's staging the works of Madame de Ségur, so you have the bad children, um, and it's staging works that the parents would have read as children. But over the 1920s, you see this evolution where the director seems to be consciously adopting children's culture that is no longer a part of adult culture. So he starts to make theatrical adaptations of comics that parents had no, uh, no connection with. There, he makes theatrical adaptations of Mickey Mouse movies, um, which I have not found any evidence of theatrical adaptations of Mickey Mouse in, say, New York City. Um, so you see this emergence of a distinctly child, children's culture, that, and you have parents saying, I don't understand this. Um, but he, tr he keeps blending the two. He, keep, he holds on to the old stuff, I think, to pacify the parents. But he starts introducing um, this more, what we would consider purely children's culture, to actually make the kids enjoy, you know, happy to come. So he can draw a larger audience. Um, I had a question. Uh, you all brought out kind of the gendered issues of it very well, but I'm also wondering kind of what we see about masculinity in here as well. Um, Sarah, you mentioned that the man is supposed to marry the one who chats nicely with the dollies, right? And I, I'm not sure what message that is for, for men, but also I noticed in some of the, the the advertisements, they're little boy dolls, too. And I was kind of wondering, what is the role of this little boy? He was in his little knee britches. Is he just there to play with the girls? Is he supposed to be the daddy? Um, and, and Julie, when you were, were talking about Maxime who rescues Gaston, and it's reinforcing, right, because he's the knight who's going to, to save, but would it have been even more reinforcing if he was going to save a little girl, right, the, the man saving you know, the damsel in distress. Um, and, and also in Jennifer's, the, the advertisement, it's boys and girls going to the theater as well. So I'm kind of wondering about the more masculine gendering of it and how that, that fits in with these things that we kind of assume is typically female. Uh, I don't know quite yet what to make of the boy dolls. They're few in number compared to the others. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure uh, exactly, you know, how many of them were purchased or uh, really whether they were even meant to be played with by boys or girls yet. So that's just an area I wouldn't, I also was curious about that. I think the doll literature um, is overwhelmingly designed to be read by girls. Um, and the 
the magazines actually feature a letters section in which, frustratingly, for the modern day historian, they only give the responses to the letters. Of course, I would love to read the original letters, um, but there's a petite post in almost every issue in which uh, the editor, usually in the voice of a doll, responds to everything from, you know, where is the doll, you know, that I sent my money in for. Some of them are clearly, you have to guess what the letter was about um, <laughs> from the responses, but some of them offer kinds of moral advice and, and, um, and so forth. But the, the um, writers all seem to be girls or their mothers. Um, so to that extent, um, I don't think there's, um, uh, if there's consumption of this by boys, um, uh, you know, it's not intended and um, I don't, I haven't found it, um, uh, you know, where there would be that audience. Now, if little brothers are picking up dolls and playing with them, you know, that's, that's hard to get at. Yeah. Um, again, I just whatever he's saying, this is just like fantastic. And to, to pick up on uh, Jennifer's thing about this wider commercial culture of childhood, I guess two things. I'm wondering kind of about a, a primitivism and colonialism register here. And I have two things, uh, specifics in mind. One is the, uh, I know there were a series of books, The Adventures of Two Dutch Girls, and it introduces the Gollywog doll. And the Gollywog, you know, was W.C.'s Gollywog's Cakewalk, you know. I, it had to have some register in, in France as well, you know. And these, these two girl marionette dolls go on these adventures with the Gollywog doll, right? And this is, this is turn of the century as well. So I think about that. I also think about um, uh, Becca scene. I know that's band dessinée, but I mean, I think I, it's adapted to theater. Absolutely, the theater. I, I I would be surprised if she wasn't, and I'm just thinking about that. But you know, she's she's this Breton bun, right? She's naive, she's a little dense. She goes on adventures, blah blah blah. I mean, any any thoughts about those things? Is she she comes up in the 1920s, and reviewers actually create her more like a hero. For, chil for children, it's a completely different evaluation of her for children than um, what we see in, say, um, Leslie Mock's work about the Br Breton stereotype. Um, so, and parents kind of are okay with Becca Seen because she's been around for so long by the time she's adapted to, to the stage for children. But what really throws parents off is when you get comics that are being created in the 1920s are being adapted to the stage like months after they've come out. And so this is stuff parents have no, no con contact with as children themselves. Um, some of it is American also, um, adaptations, so that becomes an issue. But it's su such a uniquely French way of presenting American <laughs> comics to French children um, that you really don't see it as Americanization. Um, so that comes, in. going back to your earlier question um, behind you, these troops of the Théâtre Comp, they are set up just like the adult troops. So they're, they're gender balanced, it's the same number of boys and same number of girls. You have the lead, the male leads, and then the, the, you know, the, the females that typically would play the maid positions. Um, so when you have these all child troops, it's balanced. But what happens when the child troops go away after um, Napoleon III's decree, it's pretty much all girls after that. It's only, I have, n I have not been able to find a single ma boy star of only girls. Girls were allowed to play boy parts. So you have girls cast as boys in leading roles for boys. Um, and I still haven't really put a finger on exactly why that is. I mean, some of m my theory, some of it is just developmentally. Maybe girls were easier to train um, at a younger age. Maybe there were fewer options for employment there are more options for employment for boys, perhaps. Um, I haven't really figured out why. And especially given the negative view of actresses, <laughs> I find that really puzzling. Do we have time for one more question, Kara? Um, okay, well, thank you very much for circulating these papers. I, I enjoyed reading them ahead of time, and I enjoyed having time to think about, uh, think about all three of them. And I'm glad, Jennifer, that you invoked Madame de Ségur because all three papers made me think about Ségur and, and also about all the criticism. There's, there's a great deal of criticism about Ségur, much of which focuses not only on the moralizing content of the stories, but also on cruelty. And the questions of cruelty and aggression and punishment 
uh, which are so prominent in Segiel's writing. And so I started out thinking, Sarah, about dolls. And punishment is such an important part of doll literature, right? Girls yes, punish absolutely. their dolls, and dolls are where Very girls take violently. their aggression. Yes. That's a whole other topic I didn't get into. But. <laughs> and, and so I was wondering what you thought about that and also um, about Sharon Marcus's work. And, and it seems to me that there's a lot of cruelty and sometimes children as victims of cruelty in the theater as well. Uh, poor Bonville's story about this kid whose parents decided to school him by abandoning him on an island. I mean, that's, that's a whole sort of staging of, a, of this cruel punishment. And, and I also had a question for Julie, which is, um, I'm interested in, in Talon O's uh, understanding of the history of children's literature, because they seem to, at least from your presentation, it seems to me that they think of the, the tradition of children's literature as something to reject, right? That it's not good, it's sexist. Um, and there is certainly that to it. On the other hand, children's literature is an area where women published. Um, it's a genre created by women. Um, and it seems to me there's a lot that's recoverable, potentially, from, from the history of writing for children. Um, thank you. Good questions. The, uh, I put in the pre-circulated paper some figures about female and male authors and illustrators, and I realized I didn't contextualize that. I didn't want to imply in any way that female authors or illustrators would write better gender-neutral uh, texts. So the reason why I included that was because most of my larger book project is about the production of children's literature, indeed, looking at who are the editors, who are the illustrators, how are they um, making choices for children, to hark back to Catherine's question of most of what we're talking about is adult produced material culture or literature for children based on notions that we've made up in our heads about what children want or need. Um, but um, uh, so really uh, I'm interested in that, but women authors and illustrators are, there's absolutely zero difference in the types of uh, books that they produce for, for children, but I'm very interested in the professionalization behind it. More than that, uh, whether Talon O, uh, I, I feel like they conceive of themselves as uh, novateur, uh, really changing children's literature, but part of my argument is that, that in a way they're almost uh, nostalgic or retrograde even. Um, well, just on the issue of, of cruelty and violence and punishment in the, in the doll literature, um, uh, there's often, f uh, there's frequently a scene of a, of a girl whipping her doll, um, uh, and certainly one of her putting a doll, you know, locking her in a cupboard is punishment. Um, and as far as I can tell, uh, this is much more extreme than certainly parenting manuals of the time were uh, emphasizing. Um, I mean, it's obviously reflected in, in, in some reality that this was still happening to real children. But the girls, and even in the books themselves, sometimes the mother of the girl uh, who has a doll will say you're being too harsh on your doll. And see, that's the debate. There's that uh -huh. debate about that is what's going on at the time. Right, so yes. it's almost in what Ellen's question raised too is that these are these are the things that are being recounted in the fait divers. All of the stuff, you know, kids right. being adopted, you know, just taken away by puppeteers and stuff. So it's like the construction of bourgeois childhood is all around the how not to do, except in the imagination, what the popular classes are having done to them. You are special because you get to watch it as entertainment, not be actually directly affected by it. And the, the displacement with the dolls and the punishment sounds right. like that. Right, yes, I do think there's a lot of displacement, but I haven't gotten to the bottom of exactly how it's working. But Madame de Ségur's adaptations are the most, some of the most popular uh, performances and Un bon petit diable becomes a standard but the character of Charles is played by a girl <laughs> all the time um, but in the 1920s um, I would I haven't done a quantitative analysis of it but my impression is definitely that the majority of the pieces adapted were by women they were adapted by women so playwrights it, it was a venue for them uh, the Madame de Segur pieces were all adapted by her grandson Paul de Pitre um, but the Théâtre du Petit Mont got the exclusive right um, to put on performances of her works, adaptations of her works. Um, so it really cornered the market on that. But they had all the violence <laughs> still in them. Um, because um, Maurice Rostand, 
uh, Edmund Rustan's wife and son did an adaptation of Un Bon Petit Diable as a fairy tale, which took out the violence. <laughs> um, and Paul de Pitre just hated it. And basically that's what spurred him to, to start adapting his grandmother's works, was that he felt they misappropriated it, they, they changed the story too much by making everybody um, have a happy ending. No, nothing bad happened to anyone <laughs> in their adaptation of it. Thank you very much. Thank our panelists in particular. Thank you.